directly to the word of God because there's something that God wants to say today and I need you to be prepared to hear from him today join me in Jeremiah chapter 2 and Judges chapter 16 Jeremiah chapter 2 and Judges chapter 16 I thank God for the culture, the atmosphere that's in this house from intercession to praise and worship I thank God for the flow that rests upon this ministry and that we're not boxed in whatever way that God wants to move, we're ready to move in that manner. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 23 through 27, and then Judges chapter 16. You all know we have a custom for standing for the reading of God's word here. Jeremiah chapter 2. We're in this series Still, we're in this series entitled Contagious Life, Living a Life That Changes Lives. And we started off this series, or we added to the series, uh, the message on the spirit of offense. Get out your feelings. And then we move from there to uh, attacking gossip. You and your big mouth. Uh, yeah, and then we move from there to servanthood. We talk from the subject, I'm losing my mind. Amen. And so here we are today, and this is the direction of the Lord. Um, and I had very prayerful about um, this particular message and releasing this. Uh, it's going to take some mature ears to hear, uh, but God is going to make us better. Jeremiah 2, verses 23 through 27. How can you say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after the bells. See your way in the valley? Uh Know what you have done. You are a swift camel breaking loose in her ways. A wild donkey used to the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire in her time of mating who can turn her away all those who seek her will not weary themselves in her month they will find her withhold your foot from being unshod and your throat from thirst but you said there is no hope no For I have loved aliens. After them, I will go. As the thief is ashamed when he is found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They and their kings and their princes and priests and their prophets, saying to a tree, you are my father. And to a stone, you gave birth to me. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and save us. I'm going to stop my reading there. But after all of this mess that they did, they then turn to God and say, arise and save us. If we keep reading in verse 28, God basically says, where your gods at? The gods you made yourselves. Let them save you. I'm going to marry this text with Judges chapter 16, verse 19. It says, after putting him to sleep in her lap, you may be seated. I I just want to talk from the subject, no more lap dancers. We're, we're going to talk about the battle 
with addictions. Um, go ahead, so I won't be the only one to get in trouble. Tell your neighbor, no more lap dancing. No more lap dancing. <clears throat> ask your question. What is your struggle? What, what is, what is your downfall? What is it that keeps you humble because it reminds you that you are a mess? What is your weakness? That thing that keeps you borderline saved. What is the thing that hinders you and your advancement in life and kingdom? Is it sex? Is it lying? Is it homosexuality? Is it gossiping? Is it discord, drama? Is it stealing or alcohol or is it weed, cigarettes? Is it anger, resentment? Is it unforgiveness, drugs, pornography? Is it offense? Is it shopping? <laughs> Is it gambling, for those of you who have scratch-offs in your pocket right now? <laughs> who is she that has so much influence over your life? Who, who is he that makes you drop whatever you're doing and change your plans? What is it that controls your mind, your actions? and your cell phone. What is the danger that you have fallen in love with? Question is today, what is your Delilah? The thing that has hooked you to the point where you continue putting your head in his lap. Now, today we're going to discuss a topic that may keep you quiet, and it's all right. We're going to talk about addictions. And many, if not all of us, have a problem that we are battling. And as a matter of fact, the first step to being free is admitting where you are. If we be truthful, deep down within you, there is something that craves for deliverance. Yeah. If you reach past the point where you really want to do what you're not supposed to do, even deeper, there's a desire for deliverance. Yeah. Uh, we, all, we all have struggles, and, and that's why you can't judge anyone's struggles. Mm -hmm. and all because my struggle is not your struggle doesn't mean I don't have a struggle. I, I need you to tell somebody, I'm dealing with a little something. I'm dealing with something. Now, before we move forward, I, because we, we have to address anyone who is dealing with any self-righteousness, I, I, I need to tell you that because you cover it up from church folk doesn't mean you're not exposed to God. Are, are y'all with me still? We, we, we think we're good because our neighbor doesn't know what we're dealing with or... We think we're good because the pastor hasn't said anything to us. We think we're good because, you know, when we grabbed the mic, it still worked. But the truth is, you can cover it all you want, but you're still exposed to God. I, I, I need you to move past uh, because sometimes it seems that we, we only believe God through our relationship with church. I, I often ask the question, especially to this generation, do you really believe in God? 
You've, you've heard me say it before that uh, we, we act like we are cousins with atheists. They believe there is no God, but we believe there is one, but he ain't all that serious. Do, do you actually believe in God? Because if many of us believe that if we have a good relationship in church or a good reputation in church, then that means we have a good relationship with God. And it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. What is your addiction? Now, the term, the term addict has its roots in the Latin myth of addictus. All right, I need you to hear this. The myth tells of a slave who is set free from his master but became so accustomed to his chains that he wandered the land with the chains still attached even though he could have removed them at any time. Hmm. Something in our lives has its grip on us so tightly that we can't even picture life without it. If, if you are honest, you have a love-hate relationship with it. Okay. You, 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 know, you know that it's dysfunctional. You know that it has you in bondage. You know that it's eating away at your soul. It's destroying relationships, and yet you can't picture life without it. Maybe, maybe you tried to stop. Maybe you tried to change. Maybe you tried to pray it away. Maybe you've gone to get treatment. Maybe you had some success for short periods of time only to return to your chains. Paul felt the same way because Paul, over in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 25, he, 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 talks, he starts talking and he's, he's saying something that sound, sounds a little confusing. He says, you know, I, I got this thing that I don't want to do, but I find myself doing when I really don't want to do it. it it seems like it always creeps up on me every time that I'm trying to do right I end up doing wrong he said I then find the law when I would do good evil is always I feel them drawing up on me evil is always present uh, addiction is compulsive desire accompanied by behavior that has some reward but adverse effects it is compulsive you don't control it, it controls you. Yeah. And typically, your compulsion grows in intensity and appetite. One writer says, I used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do, so the little got more and more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the reward for our addictions are often neurological, dopamine in the brain, and it makes you feel alive. It makes you feel strong. It makes you feel in control. You give your attention to it, and it numbs the pain because many of us are dealing with issues and dealing with addictions that are filling voids in our life wrongly. Uh, be, but, but it has averse effects. These effects are multifaceted. Hear me. Physical health problems, psychological and emotional disorders, addictions tend to bring isolation, increased likelihood of hiding, lying, and alienating relationships, just to name a few. Addicts are all on some spectrum of mild to severe. Watch this. People who are addicted... Some are functional in their addictions. You can still hold a job. You still serve in church with, with the appearance of purity. You still manage your relationships. And then some have train wrecked their lives because of addictions. Relationships are messed up. Family is messed up. Our physical health is messed up. We've lost our job. We've lost money. Many have lost their lives. Here's what I need you to understand. Addiction is not a one-size-fit-all. It is biological, psychological, genetic, epigenetic, physical, emotional, relational, and certainly it is spiritual. And because of its complexity, it's often controversial. There are different paths, hear me, different paths to treat addictions. There are step programs, interventions, and cognitive therapy. There's drug treatment therapy. In church, we believe in the power of deliverance. And I'm happy that the church has graduated that after the deliverance service, we go to get natural treatment. After the spiritual experience. Here's what I need you to understand. The addiction treatment industry is a multi billion dollar industry 
those of you who will admit that you have addictions, I know it sounds hard, but there's some motivation found in the word of God. In Philippians 1 and 6, it says, being confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I need you to talk to somebody and tell them God hasn't given up on me. Yes, yes, God hasn't given up on me. I have a problem, I have an issue, but the great thing about it is that God is not done with me. He has not given up on me. People have counted me out. People have given up on me, but God has not given up on me. Hmm. How, how do we get here? How do we get to addictions? Here it is. Vulnerability. Teaming up with gullibility leads to addiction. Vulnerability, teaming up with gullibility leads to addiction. The enemy knows to find us in a vulnerable state. And he will prey on our gullibility. And then push us to a place of being addicted. Yes, Lord. The natural, the natural or the nature of addictions, let's talk here. We, we have lots of appliances in our house. We have a toaster, we have a dishwasher, have a refrigerator, we got an air fryer. But all of our appliances all have the same source, electricity. Right now, the same uh, with addiction, dozen of manifestations, many causes, and it's complex, but they all have the same source. The Bible tells us that addiction at its core is always spiritual. I don't want you to miss this word today. It's always spiritual. This was the case with the Jewish people in our text uh, in the 6th century B.C. when Jeremiah is writing. They were increasingly and compulsively drawn to worship idol gods. They were worshiping the gods of their neighbors, the Assyrians and the Egyptians. They, they became totally hooked on the practices that accompanied this worship. So they found themselves constructing idols. Sex practices, rituals, celebrations of their gods. Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13, listen to what it says. But my God have exchanged, but my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me. Watch what he says. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. I need you to hear this because this is a vivid picture of addiction. Vivid picture. Forsaking the true water source and constructing wells that we think can hold water. Uh, we go to them over and over again, but they are broken, even harmful. This is the heart of addiction. Taking something or someone, even good things, and elevating them to God's status. Something we must have in our lives in order to find meaning, to cope with life, or to be satisfied. They become functional gods that we turn to find life, but can never hold the weight of our greatest needs and will rob us of true life. And at its source, at its source, addiction it's not, it is not a substance problem. It is not a food problem. It's not a spending problem. At the source, it is a worship problem. Hmm. Those of you who are taking notes, I'm going to give you four ways that addiction seduces us. Number one, denial. Denial. I can sense, especially in this room today, many of you are sitting in denial. Verse 23, look at verse 23. It says, he says to them, how can you say I'm not defiled? I don't run after the bells. He says, see how you have behaved in the valley? Consider what you have done. Israel says, no, I'm fine. What idolatry? I don't have a problem. 
listen, listen to this because I, I want you to catch this because uh, this verse 23 is very uh, vivid to help us with this particular text. And he says, see what you have, see your way in the valley. This refers to the valley of Hinnom, the deep gorge that lies to the west and south of Jerusalem. This was the place of idolatry and hideous deeds. In the valley, here are all sorts of heathen rites they were practiced, including the worship of Baal and the worship of Molech. Here they are having child sacrifices. They're, they're doing all of this messed up stuff in the valley. And then they say, I'm fine. What, what, what idolatry? I don't have a problem. And many of us are addicts just like this. Constant denying. Constant minimizing. Oh, it's quiet today. I, 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 I'm not an alcoholic. I, I just like to have fun. I'm not a sexaholic. I, my body count's not that high. I, I just like to have fun. A addiction has a blinding effect on the reality and seriousness of our problem. Tell your neighbor, you can't deny where you are. That's why you can't find deliverance. After all your shouting, after all your speaking in tongues, after all your running and all your saying, I'm free, you can't find deliverance because you're still in denial. You cannot deny where you are. Hallelujah. Whenever we hear a word like this, we always think of somebody who the word is for. Touch your neighbor and say, this is for me. This is for me. This is for me. Number one, denial. Number two, there's uncontrollable craving. Addiction seduces us through uncontrollable craving. Verse 23 and 24 he says, you are like a swift donkey breaking loose in her ways, a wild, a swift camel breaking loose in her ways, a wild donkey used in the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire, in her time of mating, who can turn her away. See, in our text, Jeremiah compares Israel's spiritual addiction to an animal in heat. Hmm. Addiction makes us less human and more like untamed beasts. Just following our cravings. It makes us turn off moral reason. And you can't hear the voice of the spirit that's saying, don't do this. Yeah, yeah, Lord, have mercy. I know I'm in a will today, God. We, we block out what, what, what the spirit is saying to us. And we begin going after whatever we're craving like we're in heat. And we have the desire, the mentality that says, who going to check me? You know, we, we, whenever we want to do what we want to do, we have the mentality of, I'm grown. Uncontrollable craving. Number three, this is how addiction seduces us. It's life destroying. Verse 25 is very interesting to me in my study. It says, withhold your foot from being unshod and your throat from thirst. Uh, in, in this particular verse, uh, here he has Hosea as given a prototype, perhaps also Isaiah. But Jehovah, what he's saying is, uh, as her true husband bids the renegade wife to refrain for very shame from acting as a harlot. Rushing barefoot into the streets, panting and with thirst that craves to be quenched for the gratification of her desires. What is happening here? Uh, and, and, and I wanted to study it from different perspectives. Uh, but the barefoot and constant thirst were marks of the exile and slave. This was the fate of the northern kingdom of Israel and would also be the fate of Judah if they did not turn to the Lord. What was happening here, he was saying, withhold your foot from being unshod or uncovered because that was like an, uh, a renegade wife who would run into the city craving, desperate, looking to satisfy herself. And we got to be careful that our addictions do not have us in a place of desperation. That I've been looking for whatever I can get to satisfy my sinful desire. Whew, Lord, have mercy. He says, he says, and make sure your throat, not from thirst. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in other words, in other words, he's saying from the worship of idol gods, watch what comes out of your mouth. Yeah. Wow. Don't allow your addictions to push you to a place where you're worshiping idol gods. Yeah. Y'all making it rough for me today, but it, you'll be all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Watch uh, how your addictions make you worship idol gods. Number four is life defining. Here's the problem here because this is a scary picture of addiction. This is a scary picture of addiction because in verse 26 or verse 25, they say, it's no use. I hear you preaching, but I'm intentionally tuning you out. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. But I don't want to hear this because I want to continue doing what I'm doing. Oh, I, I knew I was in the right place when I stood up. I wasn't confused. Verse 25, they say, I love foreign gods. In other words, I've fallen in love with the thing that's destroying me. I love foreign gods and I must go after them. Watch this. They say to Wood, you are my father. And to stone, you are my mother. Addiction will seduce you to the point that you are so deep, you believe the lie of Satan. Not only that you can never have freedom, but that your addiction defines you. That's why they say in the text, they say to a tree, you are my father. And you are my mother because the, the bottle, the pill, the money, the comments on social media are closer to you and gives you more of a feeling, meaning, and connection than God. And just like a physical birth, it's what gives you life. It's what you live for the food. You live for the purchases. You live for the attention. You live for the drama. You live for the sex. You cannot live without it. The addictions define you. It's not only what people see in you. It becomes what you see in yourself. That brings us to our text. Hallelujah. Judges chapter 16 talks about Samson and his addiction. Hallelujah. See, in, in verse 1, watch this. Samson had flaws. Samson, Samson had flaws. He has flaws, Trent, but he's still anointed. Mm -hmm. he, he has flaws, but he's still anointed. Because the Bible says that Samson went to Gaza. And saw a harlot there and went into her. In other words, he, he saw a whore and he had sex with her. Now, verse 2 says this. And, and oh, Lord have mercy. Verse 2 says, when the Gazites were told, Samson has come here. There's an army that surrounded the place where he is. And they're waiting. They're waiting, and they say, in the morning, we're going to kill Samson. <laughs> they said, in the morning, we're going to kill Samson. And the text says, I'm going to preach anyway. The text says that by midnight, Samson gets up. Lord, have mercy. Without an alarm clock. Samson gets up. The Bible says, verse 3, and Samson lay low until midnight. He rose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, carried them to the top of the hill. Here's our problem right here in the text. Because many of you think you're okay because after verse 1, you still get a verse 3. you do your sin you can still function you're still strong you still got power you still got anointing and we think we're all right because after we do what we do we can still function Woo, lord have mercy i should have hired some help today after we function we can still we still sing and they running into each other 
we, we still preach and the altar's full. And we think that we're all right with God. But I, I heard the word say, and this is what convicted me this week. I heard the word of God say, some will say at the end, I prophesied in your name. Yeah. Yes, God. I, I, I heal folk in your name. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You knew my church, but I didn't know you. Thank you, Caleb. Verse 3, Bible says, and Samson lay low at midnight. This is why I don't understand how some of you can come in church and just sit. Verse 3 tells us that there's no way you can do that because the Bible says it's God in his grace that allows us to sin but pulls us out of the situation before destruction comes to our life. Samson was asleep and with no alarm clock, but God pulled him out where, when it was time for him to be pulled out of the situation. He was supposed to die in the morning. He was supposed to die in the morning, but at midnight, midnight denotes morning. Right before it was time for his destruction, God pulled him out of the situation. Lord have mercy. You see, stop sitting there and acting like you've never been in a situation where you got yourself in trouble and destruction and trouble and exposure was on the way, but God didn't pull you out in the blink of time. If my brother Pastor Wilson were here, he would say, touch your neighbor and say, God's pull out game is strong. Okay, because he pulled me out of the situation right in the nick of time. I should have lost it. I should have lost everything. I should have lost my anointing. I should have lost my power, but he pulled me out. Tell somebody he pulled me out. Thank God he pulled me out. I got myself in the mess. But his grace and his mercy pulled me out. Samson, Samson, his assignment was to destroy the enemy's camp. When you're anointed by God, he will give you an assignment and that assignment will wreck the enemy's kingdom. But the enemy will strategize to contaminate your power. <sighs> here's, here's what you got to understand. God will put an assignment on your life. He will put an anointing on your life. But the enemy knows he can't touch your gift. So he wants, number one, he wants you exposed to mess up your influence so you can't change people's life. Lord have mercy. He, he, he wants your mind so he can stop you from using your gift. He will try to do everything he can to contaminate you so that whatever gift you got, there's no anointing on it. All right. Verse 5 says, after all of this, the lords of the Philistines came to Delilah. They say to Delilah, we need you to seduce, entice Samson. Verse 5, they came to her. They said, entice him. Find out where his strength is. For many of you, the enemy has flipped it because he has sent temptation to you. Not to find out where your strength lies but to find out where your weakness because if he can get you vulnerable he can push you to a place of addiction you got to understand that there has some there has been some meetings in hell concerning you the enemy never comes at you to trap you in something that you don't want to be trapped in <laughs> lord have mercy uh, if I was looking to sin anyway, this is what I'm going to do anyway. And the enemy knows what you want. He knows how to tempt you because he watches and studies you. We don't study him, but he studies us. 
He knows what you want because he sees what you choose. And he will always put situations in front of you that give you that doorway of opportunity. That's why I told you before, you can't flirt with your problem. You know, if you go over there, you're not just going to sit there and watch TV. You, you, you know, you know that if you just have a doorway of opportunity and see the problem is many of us put ourselves in those doorways of opportunity so we can have an excuse to say I slipped up and did it. Temptation doesn't come. Temptation is sent. The Bible says Delilah was paid. When you look at it, Delilah is paid $90,000 to betray God's man. She's paid $90,000 to betray God's man, Samson. It's quite amazing. It's quite amazing that, catch this, Jairus, catch this, catch this if you would. It's quite amazing that the strongest man who ever lived, Samson, and the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, were both conquered by women. Let this be a lesson to all men of all time. Solomon said, and I'm just reading the Bible, Ecclesiastes 7 and 26, and I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands, whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Mm. Let's, look, let's go a little further. Verse, verse 6, verse 6, here's where I have the problem because Verse 6, Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies. And with what may you be bound to afflict you? Okay, I got a problem. Because who said we don't talk in terms like this? How, how, we, go, how we go from verse 5, go entice Samson to verse 6, tell me your secrets. See, the problem is the enemy knows how to set the right opportunity in front of you when you're looking for it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. She, says, she says, hey, tell me where your great strength lies. And Samson said to her, well, if you buy me, vulnerability. If you buy me in seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and they bound, she bound him up with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Bible says he broke the bowstrings and the strand of yarn breaks when it touches the fire. So, so the secret of his strength was not known. He lied to her. Now, here's my problem. In verse 6, she says, please tell me your strength. In verse 10, she says, you lied to me. Verse 11, she says, please tell me your strength. Verse 13, she says, why are you lying? Please tell me your strengths. Verse, verse, verse 15, she says to him, please tell me your strengths. Okay, I got a problem with Samson. Because Samson, if you already know that she's trying to destroy you, why do you keep going back? Okay, because... When you tell her the lie, she sets you up for defeat. But Samson, you keep going back to her. You know why? Because Samson was having some fun. <laughs> there was something that Delilah had that Samson enjoyed. Now, now, now. Now, before you, before we get, you know, you get a little um, carnal-minded. Right, right, right. 
Let me help you because his situation is, is deeper than you think because Delilah never slept with Samson. But Samson keeps going back time and time again. He is addicted. And here's the problem. Here's what you got to understand. The problem is, watch this. Every time he went back, she said, the Philistines are upon you. You know what he got? Well, you know what he did? He jumped up and fought like he usually fights. He had all the strength that he usually has. The problem with sin is that sin offers temporary victory. Just because you survived something similar, the previous temptations, doesn't mean that you'll always get away that easy. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right. Verse 17. Oh, 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 matter of fact, verse 15. It says, then she said to him, how can you say you love me? You got to watch out. <laughs> because you will be blinded by your addiction. You will have a soft heart for your struggle. She said, I thought you loved me. How can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? You, you, you have mocked me three times. Have not told me where your strength lies. And it came to pass, verse 16, that she pressed him over and over. Yeah, yeah. Watch this. She was persistent. And the problem is many of us, our situation, our addiction is persistent, but our no is not, doesn't have any stamina. Our addiction is persistently coming at us. And our no, although it stands up strong at first, it gets weak. When you don't have the word of God on the inside, oh wait. Because the Lord just said, some of you deliberately allow your no to become weak. Because some of you are full of the word, but cut your ear off concerning the word so you can give in to the temptation. The Bible says, verse 17, she was persistent and then he told her. You could kill all the armies in your life, but if Delilah is still alive, you're still close to death. Samson continuously went back to Delilah, not realizing she was trying to trap him. He was blinded by her intimacy and her meeting something that he was lacking. A void in him that kept returning to the thing that was piece by piece breaking him down. What are you blinded by that makes you continually dance between Christ and Delilah? Too many of us can't see the trap because we're too busy looking at the bait. We're so attracted to the bait that we can't see the bait is set up to kill us. Again, I say, your no must have stamina. Mm -hmm. look, 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 at the, look at the word of God. The Bible says, she tells him, verse 19, she finally told him, so she says, lay in my lap. <laughs> Samson's problem is, he thought he could handle it. Lord have mercy. And you keep dancing with your struggle thinking that you will keep getting away from its trapping. You will keep getting away from what's trying to kill you. How strong is your need? How bad do you want that void to be filled? How desperate are you that you put yourself, your power, your anointing in danger to satisfy your need but lose your life? Bible says Samson keeps going 
from giving into his temptation to working, working in his anointing. He keeps going from giving into t- temptation to working his gifting. Giving into temptation to work in his anointing. He keeps dancing between the two. Going back to Delilah. Then going back to functioning as God has called him to function. Oh, Lord have mercy. I, I, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. How many times do you think you're going to get away with it? Straight out the bed and grabbing a mic. Spreading drama and gossip, but you still want to work in the church. Getting drunk and laying hands. Choose ye this day. How, how many times are you going to go back and forth, back and forth? Hit somebody say, no more lap dances. Don't you keep dancing with this thing. Every, how many times are you going to say, this is my last time? I need you to hit somebody and tell them you can overcome this. Here's the problem. She says, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep like he normally does. Watch what he says, Jeremiah, verse 20. I want to read it straight from the Bible. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as I have before. I will go out as before, as I have in other times. And shake myself free. I want to ask you a question. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior or are you your Savior? Because why you keep trying to save yourself? She says, he says, he says, I will go out like I have before. They'll still shout. They'll, 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 they'll still dance. People will be set free. Here's the thing. A lot of us play with the grace of God. Because some of you are anointed and gifted. And because of the grace of God, people are set free and delivered through your ministry. They're set free and delivered through what you do. And we keep playing with the grace of God because we know it's not us. It is God. So we feel like we can do what we want to because God's going to come through anyway. So we keep playing with the grace and mercy of God. Samson, the Bible says, because I want to read it straight from the word. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Samson didn't know his anointing was gone. His strength was gone. You see, gift and anointing are two different things. I said gift and anointing are two different things. Because you will always have the ability. He gives gifts and callings without repentance. You will have the ability, but it's the anointing on the ability that makes the difference. Lord, have mercy. You can get up and sing all you want to, but ain't nobody going to be saved. Ain't nobody going to be set free. Why? Because if you don't have Christ's anointing on you, and his anointing is given to you through your life of purity, who shall ascend? Who's going to go up? Who's going to have the anointing? Who's going to have the grace on this level? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Touch your neighbor and say, you got to get clean. You got to get clean. Bible says Samson got up to do what he usually does, but it failed. It failed. The Bible says the Philistines took him. They took him and took his eyes out. They put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze feathers, and he became a grinder in the prison. Here's what you got to understand. Without a vision, the people perish. He got up to do what he usually does, but it failed, and the enemy took his sight. If you stay stuck with your addiction... The enemy will take your ability to rationalize. You won't be able to see your way out of this. You won't be able to see anything clearly. Oh, my God. Come here, Romans 1. And he turned them over to a reprobate mind because they refuse. 
to see God as he is. He then gave them a mind that could not function without them. In other words, they were confused about what they saw. Women became with women, men with men. They were sexually confused. The Bible says they could not function properly. They could not rationalize. He took their sight. Bible says, James 1 and 15, then the lust, when it has conceived, bears sin, and then sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Yes. Hallelujah. Jesus. So God says today, to push us to a place where we understand that we cannot allow our addictions to keep us in a place of vulnerability to keep us thinking that we'll be able to function after it's all over with. But I can't leave you until I give you a little bit of good news. Yeah, good news yeah, all right, all right, here it is, here it is. I, I, Samson messed up, yeah, yeah. lost his power. Uh -huh. But look at verse 22. Yeah. Somewhere in between verse 21 and 22, Samson has a conversation with God. Samson begins talking to God. I'll get happy about myself right here. Samson begins to get it right with God. And while Samson is praying, while Samson is repenting, while Samson is talking to God, his hair starts growing back. Lord, have mercy. I need you to understand that when you get it right with God, he will restore you. That's why I thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy that even when I do something that gets my anointing stripped away from me, he will restore me. Little by little, my hair will start growing back. My dignity will return. My self-esteem will return. My confidence will return. My joy, my peace, my strength, my anointing, my power will return. Get somebody and say, it will return. My hair is coming back. It's coming back. The Bible says that Samson, whoo, they didn't help me enough to hoop. Samson makes up his mind, I'm going to get it right with God. And when he makes up his mind, he's going to get it right with God. His hair begins to come back. His hair starts to grow again. Right where you are, I want you to close your eyes. This is not a finger-pointing message. It's a self-evaluation message that says, where am I with God? What is it that I keep dancing in between my relationship with God and my Delilah? My relationship with God and my struggle, my addiction. What, what has become an idol God in my life? Because whatever you focus on the most becomes the thing you worship. Yeah. What has my attention more than God? What is it that I can't say no to? The Bible says in Jeremiah 2, Like it verse 26 it says as the thief is ashamed when he is found out so is the house of Israel ashamed what that was saying right there you all look at me real quick what that is saying right there as the thief is ashamed when it is found out so the house of Israel is ashamed what that text is talking about it brings to mind and you heard Lady Ashley teach on this Psalm 51. David slept with Bathsheba. Goes to Psalm 51, starts writing, created me a clean heart. Renew the right spirit. Those of us who are really saved, we really prayed this prayer when we've messed up with God. Here's the problem. David didn't pray the prayer until he was called. He didn't want to get to the place where his heart is clean. He's going to teach transgressions his ways. He didn't want to get there until he was exposed, until he was ashamed. I want to ask you a question. What's it going to take for God?
God to get you in right standing with him? What is the path of righteousness that you're going to have to go down before God gets you in line with him? He leads me paths of righteousness. What is it going to take for him to get you in line with him? Many of us, it's going to take a word from God. You just receive the word and you're going to get your life together. For some of you, you're going to have to be ashamed as the word declares. You're going to have to be embarrassed. Life tragedy is going to have to happen. What's it going to take? God is asking for me to get you to the place where you're on the right path with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, bow your head. I speak that your spirit of conviction rests upon this place from the pulpit to the door. You know what our problem is. You know what our struggle is. You know what has taken our mind. You know what we crave more than you. You know what we desire. We don't want to give up. We can't function without it. Father, whatever our addiction is, help us to be free from it. Help us to make the decision to be free. Help us to take the first step that is admitting where we are and then moving towards transformation in the name of Jesus. I rebuke every voice of the enemy that would try to get into the ear of your people even while you're speaking to them and get them to hold on to the very thing that's killing them. We speak freedom in this place in the name of Jesus. If you have an addiction you know you want to be set free from, I open the altar now. 